Well, this evening what I want to do is just continue with what we were looking at this morning. Uh, In the morning, we're going through the Gospel of John. And in the evening, we've been considering evangelism and encouragements to evangelism. And it just so happens the two of them intersect in our passage. So I thought it would be good to save the last point that was in this morning's sermon and develop it a little bit more uh, this evening, hoping it will be helpful. And I'm sure if, it's, uh, if this is a faithful exposition of God's Word, it will be. So what I'd like to do is read again the text that we read this morning, which is John chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. But we're going to focus just on the last three verses of that passage. So let's first of all read it. Um, John writes this, Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving, but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor, basically? Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. Therefore Jesus said, let her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The large crowd of the Jews then learned that he was there and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. Uh, Basically, the theme we're looking at this evening is if we live like Jesus, uh, if we are living testimonies of his truth, we will be treated uh, like Jesus. Uh, now again, this morning, we, we saw three things in this passage. We saw, first of all, the love that Jesus Christ has for his own. When his sufferings and when his death uh, were near, uh, they were only a few days away, Jesus focused on spending his time with his people, uh, not just obviously to shoot the breeze or talk about the weather, but rather to strengthen them for what it was they were inevitably going to face. Now, especially as we see in our passage, the attitude of the Jews, both toward Jesus and toward Lazarus. And of course, as we think about what the Lord has called us to do, we need to remember his love. We are bringing his gospel to a hostile world. Now, sometimes we don't look at it that way, but, but essentially that is the way it is. We were reminded in our meditation this evening that uh, not to be surprised if the world hates us, and I would say that it's, it's basically a foregone conclusion. It's not an if, but it is something that is true. All who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, and since we're called to live godly, we will suffer persecution. Now, certainly, as we think about bringing the gospel to a world that hates Jesus, we need to remember the love of Christ and we need to remember his promise that he is going to be with us, that he will draw near to us in blessing to strengthen us, to encourage us in the work he calls us to, even to protect us because he loves us. So applying what we saw this morning to what we're looking at this evening is basically what I'm doing now. Now we also saw the love that Jesus owned have for him. Those who had received his love were ministering to him, were showing him hospitality, were trying to take care of his needs. Now Mary in particular showed her extraordinary affection to the Lord Jesus Christ by anointing him with this very expensive ointment uh, for his burial. And I think we understand she didn't even know she was doing that, but Jesus said that that is why she kept this ointment. That's what she was doing at that particular point. And again, we were reminded that if we love the Lord, we're going to be willing to give whatever it is we we need to, whatever it is we have to give him, to to minister to him and to advance his cause in the world. 
This love we have for the Lord Jesus Christ is what's going to keep us moving forward through all the opposition that we're going to have to face to keep us moving forward no matter how the world might respond to the message that the Lord has called us to bring to them. And again, I don't want to give you the impression, I, and I believe we'll, we'll see that it is other than the fact that everybody is going to reject it. That's not true. There are those who are going to receive it, but I think it may be safe to say <laughs> that most will likely resist and not receive what we have to say. And then the last thing we saw was that uh, the world is, is a mixed group of light and darkness. There's two kingdoms in the world, the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And that kingdom obviously existed also within the church. It certainly existed uh, in the church of Jesus' day. It exists today as well, but we saw it this morning by the fact that there were some Jews that loved him some that trusted him, some that were giving all they had to him, even giving, them, uh, giving him their lives, while there were others who wanted to kill him. Uh, we've seen that over and over again as we've been going through the Gospel of John and also uh, that prime example that we just read about where one of his own disciples uh, was wanting basically just a prophet from Jesus and we know that it wasn't going to be long before he would betray him. So 11 of these 12 disciples were going to be those who would lay down their life for the Lord Jesus. They were in the kingdom of light. They loved him. But there was one who was going to betray him for 30 pieces of silver. You know, he loved to steal from the money bag. Any way he could profit from Jesus in a carnal or material way, he would do. But obviously he didn't benefit in any way spiritually from the Lord Jesus because he was in the kingdom of darkness. Now this evening... I want us to consider something of what Jesus calls us to face as his followers. If, if our lives have been changed by the gospel, if our lives have been changed by him, if we are becoming like the Lord Jesus Christ, we are going to be treated in the same way that he was treated. That's clearly what our meditation uh, told us uh, this evening. And here is another picture, another part of the picture of evangelism. As we draw near to the Lord and are filled with his Holy Spirit, which is what the Lord commands us to do. And as we're filled with the Spirit, as we see more clearly what it is that um, the Lord says is true with regard to everything he says, not only the duty that falls on our shoulders to promote the gospel, but also, of course, his promises. As we grow in faith, as we grow in love, as we grow in our devotion to the Lord, as we trust his promise more that he's going to be with us, and we begin to step out more and share the gospel more, we're going to face persecution. Uh, if we're not facing persecution right now, it's only because we're, we're not doing these things. We're not impacting people with the gospel. When you share the gospel, you, you run into these situations. When your life reflects the gospel, the world sees it and they react, they respond. And the way they respond, as we've seen, is negatively unless the Lord, of course, is drawing them near to him. So let's first of all think about how Jesus changes us, why it is that we're basically going to have to face this persecution. That having the life of Jesus in our souls will make us into new creatures, make us different than we were before, and it will draw attention. Now, let's think about Lazarus. Lazarus obviously was a believer before he died and was raised again from the dead. And we know this because Jesus said earlier, actually when the, the, well, the sisters of Lazarus came to Jesus, they said, Lord, the one whom you love is, is sick. And we understand this to be the kind of love that Jesus Christ has for those who are his own. This isn't the general love that God has for the world, for all men, that, that love of, of well wishing that benevolence and so forth but this is the kind of love that Jesus has for his children Lord the one whom you love is is ill that means that Lazarus was already a new creature in the Lord Jesus Christ he already trusted the Lord that's why Jesus went and spent you know that time with Mary Martha and Lazarus with his disciples because he was a part of of the body of Christ. He was in the kingdom of heaven. The Holy Spirit was already in his heart, already forming Jesus Christ in him. Now that by itself would have been enough to make him a target for Christ's 
enemies. They would already not like him. But when he was raised from the dead, his life became an even more powerful testimony of the truth that Jesus is the Messiah. I mean, how many people are there that can raise the dead? And being an even more powerful witness put him, as it were, uh, more prominently on the enemy's radar, making him the object of even greater hatred. Now, the question we want to ask is, what does that have to do with us? Well, the fact is, like Lazarus, we are new creatures in the Lord Jesus Christ. If we have trusted him, we have been recreated. We have been changed. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now we understand that in, in different senses we know that if we are united with Christ by faith that we are a part of the new creation, that in principle we are perfect in Christ, we are complete, we're even seated with Christ in the heavenly places. We are new in every sense of the word, but it also has practical implications. We begin to become more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, we it begins to appear in our lives that, that we've been changed, that we are new creatures because we're becoming like him. Now, we may not have been raised physically from the dead. We may not have died and people see us raised to life as Lazarus was, but we have been raised to life in a spiritual way. When we came into the world, we were dead on arrival. Paul writes in Ephesians 2.1, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Not physically dead, but spiritually dead, which is why we didn't love the Lord's, why we were the enemies of the Lord's, why God had to send his son into the world in order to save us. Now, while we were in this condition, we were like everybody else in the world. We were living like them. Paul continues in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3, when he says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. Now that was our condition coming into the world. Paul says that was his condition coming into the world. That's the way that everyone comes into the world. Doesn't excuse us, that's just the way it is. But thankfully, the Lord did not leave us in that condition. He didn't leave us spiritually dead. He raised us to life, which is what Paul goes on to say in verses 4 through 6. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That is a spiritual resurrection. We were dead and the Lord made us alive. It's, he says this was purely by grace. It was purely by the Father's love for us, his great love. There was nothing we could have done to do anything about it. We, we could not have changed our hearts, as we're reminded in Scripture, even as um, the Ethiopian can't change the color of his skin, as none of us can, or the leopard his spots. So you who are accustomed to doing evil cannot do what is good. We needed the Lord to change our heart by grace. You see, this is purely by grace that we have been saved and raised up. This is something that Jesus tells us that, that he does. The Father has given him the honor of being able to raise the dead. Remember what he said earlier in John's Gospel in John 5, verses 25 and 26. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, 
Even so, he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. Jesus is the one who speaks to us through the gospel and who raises us to life through the gospel by his Holy Spirit. In verse 24 of that same chapter, Jesus says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment but has passed out of death into life. And again, the point is we were dead. But Jesus made us alive. He made us into new creatures, new cre a new creation. We're a part of that new creation. Now, this spiritual resurrection may not be as much of a showstopper as Lazarus' physical resurrection. And in many ways, it really isn't. But there are ways in which the spiritual life that we now have is a greater testimony than what Lazarus possessed, either before or after his physical resurrection resurrection and I say that only because thinking of the time in which Lazarus lived and thinking in the time in which we now live we live on the other side of Pentecost the day when the Lord poured his spirit out upon his church in an even greater way than he had ever done before to strengthen and empower his people and to transform their lives into that which would make them witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ now we do need to realize that Jesus was only six days away from the Passover uh, where he was actually uh, going to be executed on the day before that Passover and be raised again on the third day and it was going to be 50 days later that Pentecost was going to come so not very long from from that time frame that we're looking at right now and Lazarus was likely going to see that day and he was going to experience that power as well but the point is he hadn't yet in this passage and yet, he was still a target of the world's hatred. Now, my point is simply this, that having experienced this spiritual resurrection, having been made new creatures in the Lord Jesus Christ, and having this fullness of the Holy Spirit, our lives should provide a powerful testimony. I'm actually arguing for a more powerful testimony than what Lazarus was able to provide through his physical resurrection. Our lives should provide an even more powerful testimony that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. Now we really can't have the Spirit living in our souls. We can't have Jesus living in our hearts. We can't, by the Holy Spirit, see the glory of God without being changed, without being transformed into the image of God. Uh, Paul writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 3, verses 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, liberty from sin. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as from the Lord, the Spirit. In other words, the Spirit of God living in us has opened our eyes to God's glory and we see it. And that glory is the glory of his holiness and, and particularly of his great love for what is right and good. And as we see that and as the Spirit focuses our attention on that, we are being transformed from one level of glory to the next. We are becoming more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. At least that is certainly what he intends through the work that he's done in our lives. Now, as we saw this morning, that change will make us love like Jesus loved. It will make us love the Father as he loved the Father. It will make us love our enemies as, as Jesus loved his enemies, and it will make us love one another as Jesus commanded his disciples to do. John 13, verses 34 through 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And notice what he says here, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. 
This is basically the testimony that Jesus has given to us, the witness, the evidence that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, that his gospel is true. It would be the love that would be displayed in our lives towards, in this passage, particularly one another, those who are part of the body of Christ. We will love them for what we see of Jesus Christ in them. You know, John tells us we can't love God whom we haven't seen and hate our brother whom we have seen and the reason why those are contradictory is because our brother has the image of God being formed in him and if we love God we will love what we see of God in that person we can't help but love them now what Jesus is talking about here in this transformation is not a love that is barely noticeable but one that is life transforming basically a a powerful love. It's the love of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, love in our hearts. Peter reminds us in 1 Peter 1, verse 22, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. Now again, as Augustine said, Lord, command what you will. And here's a command. Fervently love one another from the heart. But he also said, and Lord, give what you command. Because I can't do it apart from you. But the point is, the Lord has already given us the ability to do this. We simply need to yield to the Spirit's working within us as he seeks to lead us in the word of God and do what it is he's called us to do because this is the witness that he wants to be in us so the world will know that he is the Son of God, he is the Messiah that we love Jesus, that we love his people, that we love those who are around us is the witness Jesus has given us to show the world that we are his people. And with the fullness of the Spirit from the day of Pentecost forward, we should have a greater ability to do that than Lazarus had or Martha and Mary. Doesn't mean we are going to, but the potential is there, you see. And that's what we need to be striving after. So we are new creatures in Christ. There's a change that's taken place in our lives. Now, the second point is this, that if that's true, and if we are being transformed, and if we are living more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ, if we're living for God's glory rather than our own because we love him, if we are loving others as he loved them, the world is going to see it. And they're going to know that we're his disciples, but when they discover that, they're also going to treat us the way they treated him, as we've seen. Okay. Now, many of the Jews heard that Jesus was in Bethany, and they came to see him. But not just him. They also came to see Lazarus because they had heard what Jesus had done for Lazarus, and they wanted to see it for themselves. John writes in verse 9, The large crowd of the Jews then learned that he was there, and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. They wanted to see the evidence. They wanted to see that testimony that Lazarus had. Now, again, we have a testimony, don't we? We're, our lives are being changed. We've been raised to spiritual life. that makes a difference, and it also creates evidence. Now, when those who knew us when we were dead, and I think the key is they, they had to have known us, when they see what Jesus has done in us, it should also be so plain that they can't miss it. And there's going to be mixed reactions to that. They're going to come and see. And they're going to have different responses. Now, some of the people who come to see us are hopefully going to be those who are already the Lord's. You know, maybe people who were praying for us when we were unconverted, and now they've come to see us converted to see that the Lord has had mercy on our souls, to see that evidence, and when they see it, they're going to be thankful, and they're going to praise God for the mercy that he has shown to us. Now, there's going to be some who knew us, who perhaps were open to the possibility that Christianity is true, and they're going to come to us to see uh, what happened to us, to learn more about it, and when they do, it's going to give us the opportunity to witness to them. Now, perhaps for most of us here, those opportunities are already past but we do need to understand this that everybody who meets us from that day forward should be able to see a difference in our lives and it should provoke the question what is it that you have 
that's different. Remember how Peter says, be ready to give everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Why would anybody ask? Unless they see something that is different. And what they sh should see is this love. So it's going to, people are going to respond to it differently. But, as we're going to see in the case here of Lazarus, and of course already the Lord Jesus Christ, there are those who are going to see, and they're not going to like what they see. And they're going to hate us, because what they're going to see is that we are now like Jesus. When our Lord's enemies saw Lazarus, his testimony was drawing people to Jesus. They wanted to kill Lazarus. And basically what they experienced is the same thing that everybody who is without Christ will experience to some degree. This is the condition of their hearts. John writes in verses 10 and 11, But the chief priest planned to put Lazarus to death also because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. Again, look at how the two kingdoms respond to the same event. I mean, if we knew that the Lord had raised somebody and there were a bunch of people believing in Jesus because that had happened, how would we respond? Well, praise God. He's having mercy on so many people. He's glorifying his name by drawing people to himself through this person's testimony. But those who hate Jesus see that as a threat and they want to kill the person who is leading people to Jesus. Well, if that's the way they feel towards them, how are they going to feel towards us if we're doing the same thing? If the life of Christ is shining from us, it is going to draw the attention of our Lord's enemies. I mean, it's not a question of if, it, it is going to happen. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3.12, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And I think he means more than just desire to live like Jesus, but we desire it to the point we actually are. If we have the Spirit of God in us, we'll want to live like Jesus, we will live like Jesus, and as we live like Jesus, we will suffer persecution because there are people who are going to hate us. So Jesus transforms us into his image, and as people see that image, there, you know, some people are going to like it and some people aren't going to like it. The final question that we need to ask is, if this spiritual resurrection if becoming a new creature in Christ is going to result in persecution, what, are we, what should we do? What should we do about it? Well, first of all, we can't allow ourselves to become afraid and to deny him, even by pretending we don't know him. You know, sometimes it's like the closet Christian kind of thing. We, we see... Certain individuals in Scripture, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a secret disciple and so forth, um, there may be some times when it's maybe not a wise thing to put a Christian badge on and, and walk out in the open when you know there's people out there that are ready to kill you. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. We are supposed to be open, not pretending we don't know him, but telling everybody we do know him that we shouldn't be hiding our commitment to him because the Lord tells us, that if we do that, if we deny him, he will deny us. Because only those who don't know the Lord are going to deny him. Those who know him will confess him. Jesus says in Matthew 10, verses 32, through 32 and 33, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Now we do need to understand Jesus means these words as much as he means any words. Now he's not saying he's going to deny any of his children. But he is telling us that if we deny him, there is something terribly wrong with us. Jesus also says in Mark 8 verses, verse 38, For whoever is ashamed of me in my words in this adulterous and sinful generation... The Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. We don't want to deny the Lord Jesus. We don't want to be ashamed of him. We want to confess him openly. Now again, remember, Jesus was a marked man in, in these days we're reading about in John's Gospel. And Mary and Martha and Lazarus opened their home to Jesus knowing that, knowing that the Jews wanted to kill him, and they showed him hospitality publicly 
so that many of the Jews from Jerusalem who heard about it all came to see him. It wasn't hidden. And certainly that would only further single them out as being followers of Jesus, especially when there was a person there who had such a powerful testimony to the truth of Jesus' claims. But they did it anyway. They openly identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is what the Lord wants us to do. We must not be afraid. We need to be bold and courageous. We need to live openly as believers and continue to tell other people about Jesus notwithstanding all the threatenings that we see within our society. This is the very reason why the Lord gave us His Spirit. Not the only reason, but certainly one of the greatest reasons. Not only that we would become living testimonies of the Lord Jesus Christ and of His love towards others, but to give us the courage to witness to others of his love for all mankind if they will simply come to him and receive him. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 verses 7 and 8. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity but of power and love and discipline. Sometimes we might question whether that statement is true but it must be true. It's in scripture, right? And God doesn't lie. The spirit he has given us is not one of fear. And not one of timidity, but one of courage, power, love, and discipline. And on account of that, Paul says to Timothy, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Well, there you have it. Timothy himself was struggling with that. And Paul's reminding him that that is not what the Lord has done for you. He's given you something that's greater than that. And so you need to draw that power and strength from the Lord. After the crucifixion, when Jesus was taken away from his disciples, they were afraid for their lives. They were hiding in dark rooms and closed doors and windows. But when the Spirit of God came and they received power from above, there was a transformation. They boldly stood their ground. They publicly pro proclaimed the gospel. Thousands were converted by one sermon that Peter preached. In the face of that same persecution that they were afraid of before, now in many ways their boldness and this courage of the Spirit of God actually made their enemies back down for a time. Sometimes our enemies sort of jump on us when they see our timidity and they see the fact that we're not certain, we're not sure, we're not bold, we're not confident. Sometimes that confidence is enough to stop them in their tracks. Now again, remember the disciples were just ordinary people like we are. But they believed that the Lord would be with them. They believed the Lord's promise. They looked to him for his Holy Spirit. The Spirit descended on Pentecost. It empowered them. Peter preached this great sermon. But we find not long after that, um, they're arrested, they're threatened, they still, still have power, still have courage, but they went back together with their brethren. They prayed. The place they were was shaken. They were filled with the Spirit of God again. It's not something where you just get like a one-time zap and then after that you, you sort of ride on the mountaintop the rest of your life. You have to continually pray and ask the Lord for His Holy Spirit. And not just assume He's going to give the Spirit of God to you uh, because we have examples in Scripture and we have commands to be filled and to ask for the Spirit of God. We need to ask so they looked to him for his spirit. They stepped out in the courage and the boldness that he gave to them, knowing that he would help them. And they saw the Lord do these great things through them because they trusted, because they asked, because they stepped out in faith believing. Now, as long as we hide the light the Lord has given to us, that light of his love under a bushel, no one is going to be affected by it, for better or for worse. It's not, nothing's going to happen unless we actually shine the light, unless we actually run the risk of being persecuted. And if we do that, we know there are going to be those who are going to be saved. We do know our Lord Jesus Christ is going to be glorified. That is going to make it worth it. Uh, again, I would just point out something that Spurgeon reminded us of on Wednesday, that the wounds of Christ, the death of Christ, 
the resurrection of Christ, the ascension of Christ, his glorification, his coming again, all remind us that the Father intends to save many, many people through this work and to give them to his Son as a reward, a host uh, that no one can number as far as how many there are. And there are many of those that are yet to be gathered in. There are many of them even in this generation. We don't know exactly how many of them, but we do know that they're there and that we do need to reach them. We do know that there are many more because if, if everyone is saved who is going to be saved, there wouldn't be any reason for the Lord to hold off his second coming. I think it's going to take place once all of his sheep are gathered in. So the question we need to ask ourselves this evening is realizing that that is true and that there are sheep yet to be gathered and that the Lord has given us the witness and the power, do we really want to be a part of this work? Do we want to be the Lord's agents of salvation? Remember the Lord entrusted this to us and not to the angels. The angels were probably sitting there going, Lord, Lord, send me. I want to go. Lord, let me do it. And, and you no, know, I'm going to let my redeemed do that. That's going to be their job. And we're kind of going, wait a minute, Lord, I'm not sure that I, I want to do this. Well, that, that shouldn't be the way it is, right? We should see it the way the angels see it. And of course, if we were perfect, that's the way we would see it. But that is what the Lord calls us to do. Do we want to be a part of it? Well, if so, we need power. We need to be filled with the Spirit of God. We need to yield to the Spirit of God as he empowers us and as he leads us into this work. And so may the Lord again grant that we may seek him for that fullness. That's what we've been doing on Wednesday nights, by the way. I'll just put in a plug for the Wednesday night studies. If you're not able to make it to the Wednesday night studies, read the chapters at least that are being emailed to you and see what it is that is, as a church what we should be seeking for, and that is revival, that God would send more of his spirit, the fullness of his Holy Spirit, which is going to bring the willingness to do this work and the power to do this work because we're not going to mind the consequences. We will know that Jesus will be with us to bless us and he will give us success. And he will not only help us and bless us here, but as we do this work, we will be basically storing up treasures in heaven. And again, those things are not only for us, but they're also for him on that day when we present, as it were, cast our crowns before the Lord and praise Him because He is worthy. We don't do any of this on our own. We do not do it for ourselves. We do it by His grace and for His glory. And knowing that the Lord is going to do that work through us, knowing that He is going to bring this fruit through us, again, is a good reason to, to do it. So, let's... Um, Let's be encouraged by this to seek the Lord for more of his spirit that we might do this work effectively and not be afraid of the things that are keeping us perhaps from doing it more than we are. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us.